Well, we're going to have another chapter in our story of the Great King. And this one is called Caban's Way. You see, said Aunt Jen, I told you it would clear up. Will swallowed his last mouthful of bacon. You wouldn't think it was the same country. Marvelous. Morning sunshine streamed like banners through the windows of the long farmhouse kitchen. It glinted on the blue slate slabs of the floor, on the willow pattern china set out on the enormous black dresser, on the shelf of beaming Toby jugs above the stove. A rainbow danced over the low ceiling, cast up in a sun spell from the handle of the glass milk jug. Warm too, said Aunt Jen. We are going to have an Indian summer for you, Will, and fatten you up a bit too, my dear. Have some more bread. It's lovely. I haven't eaten so much for months. Will watched small Aunt Jen with affection as she bustled about the kitchen. Strictly speaking, she was not his aunt at all, but a cousin of his mother's. The two had grown up as close friends and still exchanged quantities of letters. But Aunt Jen had left Buckinghamshire long before. It was one of the more romantic legends in the family, the tale of how she had come to Wales for a holiday, fallen shatteringly in love with a young Welsh farmer and never gone back home again. She even sounded Welsh herself now and looked it with her small, cozily plump form and bright, dark eyes. Where's Uncle David, he said. Out in the yard somewhere. This is a busy time of the year, with the sheep and the hill farm sending their yearlings down. Sending them down for the winter. He has to drive to Tiwin soon. He wondered if you would like to go too. Go to the beach. You could be in the sunshine. <clears throat> Super! No swimming, mind, said Aunt Jen hastily. Will laughed. I know. I'm fragile. I'll be careful. I'd love to go. I can send Mum a card saying I got here in one piece. A clatter and a shadow came in the doorway. It was Riz, disheveled, pulling up off a sweater. Morning, Will. Have you left us some breakfast? You're too late, Will said cheekily. Late, is it? Riz glared at him in mock fury. Just hear him, and us out since six with only a cup of tea inside. Tomorrow morning, John, we will pull this young monkey out of bed and take him with us. Behind him, a deep voice chuckled. Will's attention was caught by a face he had not seen before. Will, this is John Rowlands, the best man with sheep in all of Wales. And with a harp too, Aunt Jen said. It was a lean face with cheekbones carved high in it and many lines everywhere, creased upward now round the eyes by smiling. Dark eyes, brown as coffee, thinning dark hair, streaked with gray at the sides and well-shaped, mottled mouth of the Celt. For a moment, Will stared, fascinated. There was a curious, indefinable strength in his in this John Rowlands, even though he was not at all a big man. Coresso, Will, said John Rowlands, welcome to Clewin. I heard you, I heard about you from your sister last spring. Good heavens, said Wills in unthinking astonishment, and even laughed. Nothing bad, John Rowlands said, smiling. How is Mary? Oh, she's fine, Will said. She said she had a marvelous time here last Easter. I was away too, then, in Cornwall. He fell silent for a moment, his face suddenly abstracted and blank. John Rowlands looked at him swiftly, then sat down at the table where Riss had already poised over the bacon and eggs. Will's uncle came in, carrying a batch of papers. Quip panade. Oh, the carrot, said Aunt Jen when she saw him. Doilich 
He ain't far, said David Evans, taking up the cup of tea she held out to him. And then I must be off to Tiwan. You want to come, Will? Yes, please. We may be a couple of hours. The sound of his words was very precise always. He was a small, neatly made man, sharp featured, but with an unexpectedly vague, reflective look sometimes in his dark eyes. I have to go to the bank and to see Lou Thomas, and there will be the new tire for the Land Rover, the car that jumped up in the air and got itself a puncture. Riss, with his mouth full, made a strangled noise of protest. Now, da, he said, swallowing. I know how it sounded, but really, I am not mad. There was nothing that could have made her swerve over the side like that and hit the rock, unless the steering rod is going. There's nothing wrong with the steering of that car, David Evans said. Well, then, Riss was all elbow and indignation. I tell you, she just lurched over for no reason at all. Ask Will. It's true, Will said. The car did just sort of jump sideways and hit the rock. I don't see what could have made it jump unless it had run over a loose stone in the road. But that would have had to be a pretty big stone and there was no sign of one anywhere. Great allies, you two. Already I can see, said his uncle. He drained his teacup, gazing at them over the top. Will was not sure whether or not he was laughing at them. Well, well, I will have the steering checked anyway, John, Riz. Now that extra fencing for the frid, they said, slid into Welsh unthinking. It did not bother, bother Will. He was occupied in trying to scorn away a small voice at the back of his mind, an irrational small voice with an irrational suggestion. If they want to know what made the car jump, this part of the mice was whispering at him, why don't they ask the Caradog Pritchard? David Evans dropped Will at a small newsagent shop where he could buy postcards and chugged off to leave the Land Rover at the garage. Will bought a card showing a sinister dark lake surrounded by very Welsh looking mountains and wrote on it, I got here. Everyone sends their love and sent it off to his mother from the post office, a solemn and unmistakable red brick building on a corner of Tiwan High Street. Then he looked about him, wondering where to go next. Choosing at random, hoping to see the sea, he turned right up the narrow curving high street. Before long, he found that there would be no sea this way, nor anything but shops, houses, a cinema, and an imposing Victoria front grandly labeled assembly rooms, and a slate-roofed lilt gate of a church. Will liked investigating churches. Before his illness had overtaken him, he and his two friends from school had been cycling all around the Thames Valley to make brass rubbings. He turned into the little churchyard to see if there might be any brasses here. The church porch was low-roofed, deep as a cave. Inside the church was a shadow. It was shadowy and cool with sturdy white painted walls and massive white pillars. Nobody was there. Will found no brasses for rubbing, but only monuments to unpronounceable benefactors like Gruffwood of Ap Atta of Inisinmagin Hall. At the rear of the church, on his way out, he noticed a strange long gray stone set up on end, incised with marks too ancient for him to decipher. He stared at it for a long moment. It seemed like an omen of some kind, though of what significance he had not the least idea. And then, in the porch, on his way out, he glanced idly up at the notice board with its scattering of parish news, and he saw the name, Church of St. Cadvan. 
The whirling came up again in his ears like the wind. Staggering, he collapsed onto the low bench in the porch. His mind spun. He was back suddenly in the roaring confusion of his illness, when he had known that something, something most precious, had slipped or been taken away from his memory. Words flickered through his consciousness without order or meaning, and then a phrase surfaced like a leaping fish. On Cadvan's way were the kestrels call. His mind seized it greedily, reaching for more, but there was no more. The roaring died away. Wild opened his eyes, breathing more steadily. The giddiness drained gradually out of him. He said softly aloud, Oh, on Cadvan's way were the kestrels call. On Cadvan's way. Outside in the sunshine, the gray slate tombstones and green grass glimmered with jewel glints of the light here and there from droplets of rain still clinging to the longest stems from the day before, Will thought, on the day of the dead, the Grey King. There must have been some sort of warning about the Grey King. And what is Cadvan's way? Oh, he said suddenly in a in fury, if only I could remember. He jumped up and went back to the news agent's shop. Please, he said, is there a guide to the church or to the town? Nothing on Tinwin, said the red-cheeked girl of the shop in her sibilant Welsh lilt. Too late in the season you are, but Mr. Owen has a leaflet for sale in the church, I think, and there is this, if you like, full of lovely walks, and she showed him a guide to North Wales for 35 pence. Well, said Will, counting out his money rather reluctantly, I can always take it home afterward, I suppose. It would make a very nice present, said the girl earnestly. Got some beautiful pictures it has, and just look at that cover. Thank you, said Will. When he peered at the little book outside, it told him that the Saxons had settled Tinwin in 516 AD, round the church built by St. Cadvan of Brittany and his holy well, and that he had inscribed the stone in the church, and it was said to be the oldest piece of written Welsh in existence, and could be translated, the pot body of Kinwe Kingen is on the side between where the marks will be. In the retreat beneath the mound is extended Cadvan. Sad that it should enclose the praise of the earth. May he rest without blemish. But it said not a word about Cadvan's way, nor, when he checked, did the leaflet in the church. Will thought, it is not Cadvan I want, it's his way. A way is a road. A way where the kestrels call must be a road over a moor or a mountain. It pushed him even the seashore it pushed even the seashore out of his mind. When later he walked absently from for a while amongst the breakwaters of the windy beach, when he met his uncle for the ride back to the farm, he found no help there either. Cadvan's way? said David Evans. You pronounce it Cadvan. By the way, one F is always a V sound in Welsh. Cadvan's way? No, it doesn't sound a bit familiar. You know, but I couldn't tell you. Will, John Rowlands is the one to ask about things like that. He has a mind like an encyclopedia. Does John, full of the old things. John Rowland was out somewhere on the farm, busy, so for the time being Will had to be content with a much folded map. He went out with it that afternoon, alone in the Sunlit Valley, to walk the boundaries of the farm. His uncle had roughly penciled them in for him. 
Clewid was a lowland farm stretching across most of the valley of the Decini River. Some of its land was marshy near the river and some stretched up the soaring scree patch side of the mountain, green and gray and bracken brown. But most of the lush green valley land fertile and friendly. Part of it left new plowed part of it left new plowed since the harvest of this year's crops, and all the rest serving as pasture for square, sturdy Welsh black cattle. On the mountain land only sheep grazed. Some of the lower slopes had been plowed, though, even though they look so steep that we'll wonder how a tractor plowing them could have kept from rolling over. Above those, nothing grew but bracken, groups of windy warped scrubby trees and grass. The mountain reared up into the sky and the deep aimless call of a sheep came now and then floating down in the still warm afternoon. It was by another sound that he found John Rowlands unexpectedly. As he was walking through one of the clearwood fields towards the river, with a high wild hedge on one side of him and the dark plowed soil on the other, he heard a dull, muffled thudding somewhere ahead. Then suddenly, at a curve in the field, he saw the figure moving steadily and rhythmically, as if in a slow, deliberate dance. He stopped and watched, fascinated. Rollins, his shirt half open and a red kerchief tied around his neck, was making a transformation. He moved gradually along the hedge, first chopping carefully here and there with a murderous tool like a cross between an axe and a pirate's cutlass, then settling this down and hauling the interweaving whatever remained of the long rank growth. Before him, the hedge grew wild and high, great arms groping out uncontrolled in all directions, as the hazel and hawthorn did their best to grow into full-fledged trees. Behind him, as he moved along his relentless swaying way, he left instead a neat fence, scores of beheaded branches bristling waist high like spears, with every fifth branch bent mercilessly down at right angles and woven in along the rest as if it were part of a hurdle. Will watched silent until Rollins became aware of him and straightened up. Breathing heavily, he pulled out the red kerchief loose, wiped his forehead with it, and retied the loosely retied it loosely around his neck. In his creased brown face, the lines beside the dark eyes turned upwards just a little as he looked at Will. I know, he said, the bell voice solemn, you are thinking, here is this wonderful healthy hedge full of leaves and hawthorn berries reaching up to the heavens, and here is this man hacking it down like a butcher jointing a sheep taming it into a horrid little naked fence, all bones and no grace. Will grinned. Well, he said something like that. Yes. Ah, said Rollins. He squatted down on his haunches, resting his axe head down on the ground between his knees and leaning on it. Duh. It's a good job you came along. I cannot go so fast as I used to. Well, let me tell you now. If we were to leave this lovely wild hedge the way it is now and has been for a lot too long, it would take over half the field before this time next summer. And even though I am cutting off its head and half its body, all those sad bent over shoots that you see will be sending up new arms next spring and you will hardly notice any difference in it at all. Now that you come to mention it, said Bill, Will, yes, of course, the hedging is just the same at home, it, in bucks. It's just that I never actually watched anyone doing it before. Had my eye on this hedge for a year, John Rowland said. It was missed last winter, like 
like life it is, Will. Sometimes you must seem to hurt something in order to do good for it, but not often a very big hurt, thank goodness. He got to his feet again. You look more healthy already, Brochen. The Welsh sun is good for you. Will looked down at the map in his hand. Mr. Rowlands, he said, can you tell me anything about Cadvan's way? The Welshman had been running one tough brown finger along the edge of his mattock. There was a second pause in the movement, and then his finger moved on. He said quietly, Now what put that in your head, I wonder? I don't really know. I suppose I must have read it somewhere. Is there a Cadvan's way? Oh, yes, indeed, John Rowland said. Live, live where? Cadvan. No secret about that. Though most people these days have forgotten it. I think they have a Cadvan Road in one of the new Tinwin housing estates instead. St. Cadvan was a mi kind of a missionary from France in the days when Brittany and Cornwall and Wales all had close ties. Fourteen hundred years ago, he had his church in Tinwin and a holy well, and he is supposed to have founded the monastery on Enily. That is a British that is in Brit English Bardsley as well. You know Bardsley Island where the bird watchers go out there off the tip of North Wales? People used to visit Tinwin and go on to Bardsley. And so they say there is an old pilgrim's road that goes over the mountain from McKinleth to Tinwin, past Aberdeenolwyn, and along the side of the valley, no doubt, or perhaps higher up. Most of the old ways go along high places. They were far safer there, but nobody knows where to find Cadvan's way now. I see, said Will. It was more than enough. He knew that now he would be able to find the way given time, but increasingly he felt that there was very little time left that it was urgent for his quest, so oddly lost by his memory to be accomplished very soon, on the day of the dead. And what was the quest? And where? And why? If only he could remember. John Rowlands turned toward the hedge again. Well, I'll see you later, Will said. Thank you. I'm trying to walk all around the edge of the farm today. Take it gently. That is a long walk for a convalescent, the whole of it. Roland straightened suddenly, pointing a finger at him in warning. And if you go up the valley and get to the Crag Air Adrian end, that way make sure you check the boundaries on your map and do not go off your uncle's land. That is Caradog's preacher's farm beyond, and he is not kind with pre trespassers. Wolf thought of the malicious light-lashed eyes in the sneering face he had seen in the Land Rover with Riz. Oh, he said, Caradog Pritchard? All right, thanks. Diolich in Far, is that right? John Rowland's face broke into creases of laughter. Not bad, he said, but perhaps you should stick to just Diolich. The gentle thud of the axe dwindled behind Will and he was lost in the insect hum of the sunny afternoon with the scattered calls of the birds and sheep. The way that Will was going led sideways across the valley, and the gray-green sweep of the mountain rising always before him. It blocked out more and more of the sky as he walked on. Soon he was beginning to climb, and then the bracken began to come up in over the grass in a rustling knee-high carpet with clumps here and there. There was spiky green gorse, its yellow flowers still bright among the fierce prickling stalks. No hedge climbed the mountain, but a slate-topped dry stone wall curving with every contour, broken now and then by a stile step, low enough for men to put high, but too high for a sheep. 
Will found himself losing breath far more quickly than he normally would have done as soon as he next came to a humped rock the right size for sitting he folded thankfully into a panting heap while he waited for his breath to come properly back he looked at the map again the clearwood farmland seemed to end about halfway up the mountain but there was of course nothing to guarantee that he would come across the old cadvan's way before he reached the boundary he found himself hoping a little nervously that the rest of the mountain above was not Caradog Pritchard's Lane. Stuffing the map back into the pocket, he went on higher through the crackling brown fronds of the Brocken. He was climbing diagonally now. As the slope grew steeper, birds whirred away from him. Somewhere high above, a skylark was pouring out in rippling, throbbing song. Then all at once, Will began to have unaccountable feeling that he was being followed. He looked around. Abruptly he stopped, swung around. Nothing moved. The bracken brown slope lay still beneath the sunshine, with outcrops of white rock glimmering here and there. A car hum hummed past on the road, invisible through the trees. He was high above the farm now, looking out over the silver thread of the river to the mountains rising green and gray and brown behind and at last fading into blue distance further up the valley the mountain site on which he stood was clothed dark green with plantations of spruce trees and beyond those he could see a great gray black crag rising a lone peak lower than the mountain around it yet dominating all the surrounding land a few large blackbirds circled its top. As he watched, they merged together into a shape of a long V, as geese do, and flew unhurriedly away over the mountain in the directions of the sea. Then, from somewhere close, he heard one sharp shh, bark from a dog. Will jumped. No dog was likely to be on a mountain alone if there was no sign of another human being anywhere. If someone was nearby, why was he hiding himself? He turned to go on up the slope, and only then did he see the dog. He stood stone still. It was poised directly above him, alerted, waiting, a white dog, white all over with one small black patch on its back, like a saddle, except for the curious pattern of coloring it looked like a traditional wild sheepdog, muscular and sharp-muzzled with feathered legs and tail, a smaller version of the collie. Will held out his hand. Here, boy, he said, but the dog bared his teeth and gave a low, threatening growl deep in his throat. Arrgh. Will took a few tentative steps up the slope, diagonally in the direction he had been going before, crouching on his stomach. The dog moved with him, teeth glittering, tongue lolling. The attitude was odd and yet familiar, and suddenly Will realized that he had seen it in the evening before in, in the two dogs on his uncle's farm that had been helping Riz bring, down, bring in the cows to be milked. It was the movement of control, the watchful crouch from which a working sheepdog would spring to bring to order the animals that was driving in a particular direction. But where was this dog trying to drive him? Clearly, there was only one way to find out. Taking a deep breath, Will turned to face the dog and began deliberately climbing straight up the slope. The dog stopped and the long, low growl began again in his throat. It crouched, its back curved, as if all four feet were planted like trees in the ground. The snarl of the white teeth said, very plainly, not this way, but Will, clenching his fist, kept climbing. He shifted directions very slightly so that he would pass close to the dog without touching it, but then unexpectedly, with one short bark, the dog darted towards him, crouching low, and involuntarily 
Will jumped and lost his balance. He fell sideways on the steep hillside, desperately reaching his arm wide to stop himself from rolling headlong down. He slithered and bumped upside down for a few yards. Terror loud as a shout in his head until his fall was checked by something jerking free fiercely at his sleeve. He came up against a rock with a numbing thud. He opened his eyes. The line was a mountain the line where mountain met sky was spinning before him. Very close was the dog, its teeth clamped on the sleeve of his jacket, tugging him back all warm breath and black nose and staring eyes. And at that side of his eyes, Will's world spun round and over again, so fast he thought he must be falling. The roaring was in his ears again, and all those normal, all things normal became suddenly chaos. For this dog's eyes were like no eyes he'd ever seen. Where they should have been brown, they were silver white, eyes the color of blindness yet in the head of an animal that could see. As the silver eyes glazed into him and the dog's breath panted out hot on his face, in a whirling instant will remember everything that in his illness had taken away from him. He remembered the verses that had been put into his head as a guide for the bleak, lone quest he was destined now to follow. The design that under the mask of conscience, coincidence had brought him here to Wales. At the same time, another kind of innocence fell away, and he was aware, too, of immense danger, like a great shadow across the world, waiting for him all through his unfamiliar land of green valleys and dark misted mountain peaks. He was like a battle leader, suddenly given news, suddenly made aware, as if he had not been a moment before, that just beyond the horizon, a great and dreadful army lay in wait, preparing itself to rise like a huge wave and drown all those who stood in its way. Trembling with wonder, Will reached down his other arm and fondled the dog's ears. It let go of his sleeve and stood there gazing at him, tongue lolling pink from the pink-rimmed mouth. Good dog, said Will said, good dog. Then a dark figure blotted out the sun, and he rolled abruptly over to sit up and see who st stood outlined there against the sky. A clear Welsh voice said, Are you hurt? It was a boy. He was dressed neatly in what looked like a school uniform, gray trousers, white shirts, red socks, and tie. He had a school bag slung over his shoulder and he seemed to be about the same age as Will, but there was a quality of strangeness about him, and there had, as there had been about the dog, that tightened Will's throat and caught him motionless in a wandering stare, for the boy was drained of all color, like a shell bleached by the summer sun. His hair was white, and his eyebrows, his skin was pale. The effect was so startling that for a wild moment, Will found himself wondering whether the hair was deliberately bleached, done on purpose to create astonishment and alarm, but the idea vanished as swiftly as it came. The mixture of arrogance and hostility facing him showed plainly that this was not that kind of a boy at all. I'm all right, Will said, standing up, shaking, pulling bits of bracken out of his hair and off his clothes. He said, you might teach your dog the difference between people and sheep. Oh, said the boy indifferently. He knew what he was about. He would have done you no harm. He said something to the dog in Welsh, and it trotted back up the hill and sat down beside him, watching them both. Well, Will began, and then he stopped. He had looked into the boy's face and found there another pair of eyes, the same eyes to shake him off balance. It was not this time the unearthliness he had seen in the dog. It was a sudden shock of feeling that he had seen them somewhere before. The boy's eyes were a strange, tawny golden color like the eyes of a cat or a bird, 
rimmed with eyelashes so pale as to be almost invisible. They had a cold, unfathomable glitter. The Raven Boy, he said instantly. That's who you are. That's what it calls you in the old verse. I have it all now. I can remember. But ravens are black. Why does it call you that? My name is Braun, the boy said, unsmiling, look, looking unwinkingly down at him. Braun Davies, I live down on your uncle's farm. Will was taken aback for a moment in spite of his new confidence on the farm. With my father in a cottage, my father works for David Evans. He blinked in the sunshine, pulled a pair of sunglasses from his pocket and put them on. The tawny eyes disappeared into shadow. He said in exactly the same conversational tone, Braun is really the Welsh word for crow. But people called Braun in the old stories are linked up with a raven too. A lot of ravens in these hills there are. So I suppose you could say the raven boy if you wanted poetic license like. He swung the satchel over his off his soldier, shoulder and sat down beside Will on a rock, fiddling with a leather strap. Will said, How did you know who I was? That David Evans is my uncle. I could just as well ask how you know me, Braun said. How did you know to name me the Raven Boy? He ran one finger idly up and down the strap. Then he smiled suddenly, a smile that illuminated his pale face like a quick flame, flaming fire, and he pulled off the dark glasses again. I will tell you the answer to both questions, Will Stan Stanton, he said. It is because you are not properly human, but one of the old ones of the light, but here to hold back the terrible power of the dark. You are the last of the circle that's to be born on earth, and I have been waiting for you. Well, we'll have to see what the raven boy has to do in the next chapter that we read. And it's starting to get exciting. You have a good evening.